Good morning. To be the first panel on the second day of the symposium is always a difficult slot to have. But uh, there's also this great saying, the people that are there are exactly the right kind of people. So I thank you all for coming this early on the second day and welcome you to the panel, Teilen als Gebot, the sharing imperative. In the context of the three monotheistic religions, the practice of sharing is imperative. The Torah already postulates not to forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Christianity also is based on the principle of sharing as one of its really essential guiding principles, last not least symbolized in the Last Supper and the bread sharing that is done in the Last Supper. And in Islam, zakat, the practice of almsgiving, is one of the five obligatory pillars that Muslims are supposed to adhere to. So in this panel, we would like to more closely examine this notion of sharing as imperative. But in this panel, we would like to go beyond the perspective of the three monotheistic religions and take a broader perspective a broader perspective in terms of intercultural perspective as well as, as interdisciplinary perspective. Because here with me on the panel, we have three really noted international thinkers from very diverse backgrounds. We have Rajiv Bhargava, a political theorist from Delhi, India. We have Annalyn Salvador Amores, a social anthropologist from Baguio City, Philippines. And we have Wolfgang Sützel, a media theorist and philosopher from Ohio, USA. And to start us off, each panelist will give us an input of about 10 to 15 minutes each from their individual perspectives. We will then have a panel discussion to bring the different perspectives together. And in the end, you as the audience, you will have the opportunity to share your questions. So, let me introduce the first speaker. Rajiv is senior fellow and former director of the Center for the Study of Deve Developing Societies in Delhi. As professor of political theory, his academic career has taken him to numerous places. It, he was in Delhi at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, to Harvard, University of Bristol, Institute of Advanced Studies, Jerusalem, Sciences Po, pa Paris, Wissenschaftskolog Berlin, and Institut für Wissenschaften Vienna, just to name a few. His works on political theory, multiculturalism, identity politics, and secularism have really sparked quite sometimes also controversial, heated debates. His current research focuses on issues of religious diversity and how this plays out throughout history, especially in India. And I would like to kindly ask you, Rajiv, to start us into the discussion. From your perspective as political theorist, what is your take on sharing as imperative? Please. You will right. have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honored to be part of this uh, symposium. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, Indian traditions and in my, in my first uh, few minutes, uh, I'll, I'll lay down the basic conceptual framework within which I'd like to place uh, some of the issues uh, that I raised today. The four questions that I have in mind are the following. One, what is it to share? What does it mean to share? Two, what is it that one shares? you know, which entities, uh, uh, which goods, and so on. Number three, who does one share it with? And number four, how does one share? Which gives you some idea of what uh, forms of sharing there are. So, uh, on, on the first question, what is it to share? As I'm sure everybody knows, uh, to, to have a portion uh, of something with others, to give a portion of something with others, to use, uh, occupy, or enjoy something 
jointly with others to possess a quality or an activity in common with others. Uh, that's roughly what we mean by sharing. Uh, the, uh, the, the things that we like to share are, could be qualities, they can be views, they can be activities. You know, you can, have, you can share identities, narratives, uh, you can share labor, uh, but you can also share sacred, sac the sacred, ob you know, sacred objects, uh, transcendental beings, uh, uh, and, and so on. But, but I, I, I'd like to group all this together into two, uh, two, two uh, rubrics, one which I would call material goods and the other which I'll call cultural, but most specifically spiritual goods. Uh, and I do this because I'm going to focus on uh, one uh, caste in the Indian tradition and religious pluralism, which is the spiritual domain in the Indian tradition. The third, of course, is who is one to share all this with, and, and you could, that could be you know, the individual or uh, family or clan or caste in the, Indian, in, the case, in the Indian case, the nation, it could be the humanity, uh, it could be all species. So depending upon which, you, which uh, subject you choose of all these will uh, determine uh, whether how inclusive you are or how exclusive you are and so on. And finally, forms of sharing. Now this is, I think, especially important for my discussion because uh, sharing could be without any division. I said in the beginning that you, when you share, you share a portion of something with someone, but it needn't be, uh, you needn't divide anything up. Uh, when, you, when you share, for example, a beautiful landscape with others, you're not dividing it up in any way. So it could be, you know, you could have sharing without division, but you can also have sharing with division. And this division could be equal, which would be, you know, ethically and morally uh, wonderful, but it could also be unequal. And in unequal sharings, there are different forms, one of which I would like to call self-abnegating sharing or self-denying sharing. And uh, this is the form of sharing that takes place in, in hierarchical societies, uh, societies where there's a lot of inequality. Uh, so, for example, slaves uh, share or you know, quite a lot of the labor uh, and what they produce with others. Uh, in India, the outcasts and the lower castes uh, were sh constantly sharing, you know, anything that they produce with others. Uh, but, and of course, women, I mean, they, they have to, in some ways, you know, there's a lot of self abnegation involved in, in this kind of sharing. So that's one. The second is uh, self-enhancing sharing. And uh, that's in, you know, when, you, when you make donations or gifts, you give up something to others. And as you give it up, you actually enhance yourself. Uh, there's no self-abnegation here. And there is a third, which is a mixture of both, uh, a little bit of self-abnegation, a little bit of self-enhancement. And that is you know, when you have saints, saintly, you know, sacrificial, you s the, the saints give up a lot of what they have to others, uh, but, but there is no, uh, uh, you, there is a denial of the self, but also there's a huge enhancement of the self from the power you, that you're able to generate, and so on. Now, okay, that's one. Uh, I've already spent, taken a lot of time. <laughs> how much time do I have? Hmm? I know. Is it, is how many minutes have I taken? Seven, five. Only five. Oh, good. So now, now what's the opposite of all this? Opposite of sharing. And that's, of course, not sharing anything with others. Uh, and I was looking for an English term for it. I didn't find any uh, suitable, uh, satisfactory term. Uh, but, but the phrases uh, are, you know, you use, certain, you use something entirely on your own. You occupy something solely. On, uh, on your own, you enjoy something exclusively by yourself, uh, but all of this is underpinned by a desire to have more and more of something, you know, even at the cost of others, disregarding the claims of others, 
taking away uh, what rightfully belongs to others, uh, as if other things and other people, uh, they exist only for your own benefit and not for, it, not for you know, intrinsically, uh, you know, they're not working for themselves, but they're working only for you. Now, there is a Greek term for it, which, is, which I found very useful, and that is pleonexia, which is uh, the idea that you, that it's, it's the opposite of justice. You, 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 it's, you don't get your own fair share. Uh, uh, you, on the contrary, you try and grab more and more of it. And there is an objective. I don't know whether this objective exists, but I'm, I'm going to invent it. <laughs> Pleonectic. Pleonectic would be a quality of human beings, uh, which, is, uh, which, which, is, which you know, just takes more and more uh, uh, from, from, uh, from the pie, uh, the whole of it, if possible, not giving anything to others. OK, having done this conceptual framing, uh, I'd like to come to the Indian context. And I'd like to talk about something that existed in the past and, and what is uh, happening now. So the tradition, uh, traditional India and modern India. And I'd say that the real, what, what is happening is we are a transitional society moving from traditional to a modern society. And when we think about what was happening in the tradition, and I'm going to you know, do it in two respects, the material goods, as I mentioned, and the spiritual goods on the other. So as far as material goods are concerned, uh, I think what there was in the past was what I'd like to call a nexus between self-abnegating sharing and pleonexia, a, a nexus. And what do I mean by that? I mean that there was, on the one hand, one set of people, one group of people, say the women, lower caste, outcasts, who had no sense of their self, who had no idea of their self-interest. Uh, I mean, ideally, in an ideal, it's an ideal typical. Uh, uh, and who had, who had, uh, uh, who, uh, who didn't really think that their desires were, were worthy enough to be fulfilled. Uh, so whatever they produced, whatever they generated, whatever they did was only for the sake of others. And this is, you know, so, so they gave up everything to others. They shared everything that they had, except very minimal. They gave it to others. And, and that's so self-abnegating sharing. But on the other hand, there was another group of people who believed that everything that was produced and generated was only for themselves and not for others. So they were what I call pleonectic. Uh, they, they, and this, uh, both these ideologies of uh, self-abnegating or this, this kind of mode of existence of self-abnegating sharing on the one hand and pleonexia on the other, they, they fitted very well. They interlocked, they were complementary. Uh, uh, they, 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 uh, they, they formed a certain kind of uh, nexus because it suited very well for the pleonectic people to have another set of people who thought that their desires were not worth fulfilling at all. Uh, and that they were there, they existed, and they did everything only for them. And uh, so, so this nexus existed in traditional hierarchical societies, whereby some people believed and they were convinced that they were there only for the sake of others. And there were others who also believed that these other guys existed only for the sake of others. Now, if this nexus was there in hierarchical societies, when the wave of egalitarianism began in India, uh, these hierarchies began to collapse. And those people who didn't have a sense of themselves, who had no idea of self-interest, who thought that their desires were not worth fulfilling at all, they began to have a sense of self. They began to feel that their desires must be fulfilled. They had an idea of self-interest. And, and so, and the model of fulfilling these desires was a model of the upper castes, uh, of these male patriarchs who, 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 who were, uh, who were uh, rampaging egoists. And, and so what we have now is generalized egoism in India. There is no sharing. Uh, everybody is, is grabbing things all the time. And this has been uh, enhanced by the post-liberalization, uh, globalization phase uh, in this in this transitional society, when we're moving from uh, from inegalitarian hierarchies to 
to, to egalitarianism, this is exactly what is happening. Okay, so that's one part. Now, what about spiritual goods, which is very, very interesting and very important? As I said, uh, these were, uh, India was a place where, uh, every, you know, where things, gods were shared, uh, spiritual ancestries were shared, uh, where um, saints and, and temples and mosques and shrines were shared. And they were shared by, by groups which were as different from each other as Hindus and Muslims. And, and, and there, was, there was a lot of sharing here. And so how could that be possible? What were the conditions that made that possible? Well, first of all, there was no political interference in that. Politically, you can stop this from happening, but that didn't happen. There was a social condition which made it possible. There was no so, so, socially oppressive, uh, homogenizing institution uh, such as the medieval church, which uh, acted as a gatekeeper on who's to enter and who's to exit, and you know whether people are remaining within one community and uh, or not, and so on. So that didn't exist. But more importantly, there was a theological condition uh, which was fulfilled at that time, and uh, uh, by that I mean that there was no one who said that the other is an enemy. The other is an existential threat, uh, that other forms of worship are not true, they were false, and that you were forbidden to worship these other gods. Uh, so th that, that, that theological condition was simply not there. Uh, in fact, people were encouraged to worship other gods. And now, uh, okay, so now uh, we have several examples of that. Uh, you know, in Kashmir, two minutes. Okay, so in, in, I can go on and on about it. in Kashmir, in Punjab, uh, and, and, and there were people who were looking for equivalences all the time between Vishnu and, and, and Muhammad or Krishna. Uh, there were people who, who uh, believed that a particular uh, uh, Sufi was also a Hindu sage and, that, and the Sufi was, was behaved like an ascetic, uh, 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 he was a celibate. So people who were Islamic looked more and more like Hindus and it was easy for everybody, Hindus and Muslims alike, to identify them, to be attached to them and to owe their allegiance to them. And this goes all the way. There was, in the 19th century, there was a, 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 the, the Sai Baba of Shirdi in, 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 the, in southern India and the followers exist even now. And there was, you know, Gandhi himself, who, who uh, his most uh, favorite devotional song was Allah Tero Naam, Ishwar Tero Naam, meaning, you're, you know, you, you are, you can be called, you, you know, you, almighty God, you can be called Allah, or you can be called Ishwara. Ishwara is a Sanskrit term. So these are, you, you are you're both, uh, you, you it's not exclusive, one or the other. And so there was, there was no sense of exclusivity. Uh, there was a shared fluid identity. And what has happened in these last uh, 100 years or so is that there's been a religionization of forms of worship and spiritual allegiances. I don't want to explain. Uh, I, I could explain what I mean by that, but I'll leave it to the discussion because there's very little time. There was nationalization of this religiosity. Uh, the uh, the space of the sacred space, which earlier times were occupied by more than one spiritual traditions, now that sacred space had to be occupied just by one tradition, and the public space, which was occupied by many religions, was now supposed to be occupied by only one. So there was, there was all this exclusivity has been introduced. This uh, competition, this rivalry, uh, and and you know we had in the last. You know, 50, 50, 50, 60 years ago, we had uh, a partition uh, which was grounded in this, in these, uh, in these uh, radically demarcated and opposing uh, religious communities. All of this, which was pretty foreign to Indian soil, and so we have now, as a result of this egalitarianism, that was you know equal and unequal shared spaces, sacred spaces. But what we have now is. Once again, what, 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 what we can call communal egoism, again, rampant egoism, where each community just wants everything for itself, 
uh, uh, and uh, there are no, not just uh, the non-existence or non-sharing of, of spiritual spaces, but also on the basis of identity, non-sharing of non-religious spaces. So in India, non-sharing rules today, <laughs> and like in the past when, when things were uh, more uh, you know, readily and easily shared. So I'm sorry I took a little more time. Thank you very much, Rajiv, for this very insightful look at how this plays out in the Indian context. I would like to give the word now to our next panelist, um, Annalyn Salvador Amoresi, a professor of social anthropology at the University of the Philippines in Bagui. Bagui, uh, sorry. She was the first Filipina scholar to obtain a master's degree and doctorate in anthropology from Oxford University. Her research interests focus on non-Western aesthetics, endangered languages, material culture, and visual anthropology. In her fascinating and prize-winning book, Tapping Ink, Tattooing Identities, she looks at how tattoos become part of sharing rituals, and thus function in a way as expression of identity and family relations. In your current research, you also look at how this works out with textiles and weaving. And now I would like to ask you, Annalyn, from your perspective as a social anthropologist, how do you gauge the notion that sharing as a cultural practice is imperative in the context where you're working in the Philippines? Okay, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, we're in a different time zone in the Philippines. It's night time, so let's try to be, uh, I'll try to be awake. <laughs> okay, um, according to Marcel Moss, uh, there are three notions of gift exchange. One is to give, and one is to receive and to reciprocate. And in this case studies, uh, in this case study that I will present, uh, I will talk about how a certain community in northern Luzon, Philippines, have maintained traditional gift exchange and sharing in the community despite the persistence of modernity and other uh, external influences like education, Christianity, and tourism in the area. So the three questions that I, that I would like to ask is, what is the notion of the gift among these people? Second, was it, what is it in the gift that would compel the receivers or the donors to exchange gifts? And then lastly, how is uh, the gift shared? And if there is a failure of gift giving, what happens to that one? So uh, as you can see, this photograph is, uh, you can see mid redistribution in the area. And uh, the community is found in the northern part of the Philippines in Kalinga region. They are highly, um, uh, have a complex agricultural system, uh, wet rice terracing. Uh, one of the houses there is actually my field house. No? I did my anthropological work for over 16 months in the area. So here uh, you can see the community and like I said, the tradition of sharing is very evident in, in this area. And most of the tattooed women also narrates that tattoos also form as a gift, no? Making gifts as permanent. So uh, here are, are, I argue that the process of gift giving is at the core among this uh, community. And in fact, they have a word for the gift, which is called the atod. Atod meaning to give or even to share, which is used interchangeably in this particular community. So, um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the process of gift giving is more important than the amount of gift given to a particular person or to a particular uh, community. You know? So whether that's uh, uh, rice or meat or vegetables, etc., uh, the gesture of gift giving is more important. So we start with uh, with the paranos. This is a very very uh, perhaps a massive ritual which entail a lot of uh, meat, uh, offering of and sacrifices of meat, uh, red meat redistribution to all the households. Okay, so you start with a chicken, uh, which is done in the households, then you have shared meals in the community, 
No? So to accept a gift or to be offered to eat inside the house, meaning uh, it is understood that you have to reciprocate it with courtesy, hospitality, and um, honesty once you enter the house. So, so sharing begins uh, in, in the household. The other ritual is the posipos. No, this is a, uh, like a ritual of, uh, the, um, given to the elderly uh, to celebrate their achievements. So they pull together uh, labor and resources to set up that particular uh, ritual. So uh, wood, and also they invoke kinship relations for meat redistribution. So as, as many anthropological accounts would say, um, it is argued that this sharing also helps clarify social roles, uh, wealth, and as well as to uh, confirm a certain status in the community. So they invoke that and they have this massive redistribution of meat in the community. Uh, it is distributed to the elders, to the women, and to the children, and then of course to communities where they had peace packs. Uh, so most of the, the, uh, the me uh, elderly men are only allowed to participate in the preparation of the meat because uh, they believe that when a younger man would participate in this one, he would become infertile, or women would, become, would have a shorter life when they participate in this particular event. So there's, there's a kind of, mag uh, let's say, magical or certain taboo qualities found in, in the gift as well. So they pull, up, pull together the rice uh, uh, cooked by the women, um, uh, et cetera, and they are redistributed in the community. And also children uh, participating in the event and there's also ritual dancing uh, uh, mostly from the elders to show their respect and to show their reverence no, for that particular elder. Okay, so aside from material goods uh, in sharing and exchange, also the presence of elders uh, through communication, through participation in dancing, ritual dancing is also a form of gift. No, this is immaterial. And of course, uh, you have there again the meat uh, being redistributed. And um, unknown to many, there is also the participation of the, of the spirits and the form of magic in, in exchange. And they also offer, for instance, you have uh, material goods, and they also have to offer meat to the ancestors, such as this one. So at the center of the village, there is a massive tree uh, where it is believed to be the dwelling place of ancestral spirits and malevolent spirits. They also have a notion of this fear that they, if the spirits are not appeased, then they will bring misfortune to the community. So the members of the community have to appease by offering uh, a portion of the meat. Uh, you can see here, it's like um, found uh, at the bottom of the tree. So you can see that there is also an exchange of the unseen, the ancestral spirits with the, with the community. Here uh, is a photograph of appeasing the spirits to show the status of that particular person, that he is able to uh, um, celebrate you know, the ritual of uh, sharing in the community, that he's worthy, he's a worthy person. So in death, uh, exchanges are also happening, such as uh, chants or, or prayers or ritual chants that are offered to the dead as well as gifts for the dead, and also to other um, ancestral spirits or malevolent uh, spirits present in the area. And lastly, uh, perhaps uh, uh, one of the things that I found out in this particular community is that gifts are also made permanent through body tattoos. So, Gifts also, uh, tattoos also serve as a kind of uh, continuous bodily archive of memories of uh, 
mementos of people's uh, um, souvenir when they visit a certain place. No? So they actually tattoo themselves no? to remind that of the gift from the person. Uh, through the form of tattoos. So this is Wang Un. She's a 90-year-old uh, tattoo practitioner from the village. And uh, she avers that tattoos are also gifts. No? Tattoos are also permanent gifts to a particular person. So I'll show a quick video of how tattoos can be made permanent. Okay, so in the village, uh, people go there. Uh, in the past, it is a requirement to get a tattoo, especially for the women and the men in the village. It is a form of aesthetics, and it's also a painful rites of passage. And at the same time, it also serves as a gift, no? uh, like a biography of that particular person, uh, and gifts are made permanent with tattoos, uh, with various designs, no? accorded to that particular person. So a certain symbol would signify something uh, like the characters of a person or uh, symbols derived from the community. You know? So the character of that person is actually made permanent in the form of tattoos. OK. An interesting point here, if you can see, if you can read the tattoo name, uh, the names found. <laughs> Sorry for that. Do you have tattoos <laughs> by chance? Yeah. So how does that, uh, what does that mean to you? Is that a kind of gift or a remembrance of a particular person or an event? It's the same way in this particular community where they tattoo and consider that as a permanent gift. So it's a painful way of receiving a gift from the elders. Okay, so if you can see here, there are, you can actually read the names of the person who tattooed a person. So that uh, when they visit a village to another village, they would tattoo the names of their friends. No? So that in a way, there is an exchange of tattoos. No? Uh, done to another person. No? So they have a kind of uh, uh, a permanent archive through the tattooing of names or the exchange of names in this particular practice. So here, this is a traditional uh, look of uh, tattoos, traditional tattoos of men and women. But if you see the name tattoos, this is kind of new tattoo wherein you can actually tattoo uh, the person's memory in the body. Is my time up already? Okay, just to finish, um, for this, uh, this particular tattoo is also uh, a tattoo given by the father of this elderly woman, a remembrance from the father. You know? So she considered this tattoo as a permanent gift. So in other words, uh, there is a, a very complex uh, relations between sharing and gift exchange among this community. And this is just, sharing is just one of the, one of the many wide arrays uh, reflecting the political, social, religious aspect of that particular community. So this sharing is a window to understand the con that complex whole. Thank you very much, Anna Lynn. I think so far we've heard from two very interesting examples of imperative sharing. In India, Rajiv, you describe to us processes where I would say one goes from imperative sharing to imperative non-sharing. And you, Annalyn, just described to us uh, in the Philippines uh, forms of very permanent imperative sharing. You know, a very vivid example being that of the tattoo, which is there for a lifetime basically to remain on the skin. And to me, the question arose, but 
to be discussed later, I think, is how changes in our context, present day, you know, globalization, digitalization, would affect these basically forms of permanent imperative sharing. But before we get to that, I would like to introduce our third speaker, and maybe he will already contain some of the answers to that question. Wolfgang Sützel is media theorist, philosopher, and translator in between Europe and the United States. In his research, he focuses on theories of sharing, political media theories, and the critique of violence. He's currently professor at uh, Ohio University. He's also affiliated with TransArt Institute um, in New York, Plymouth, and the UK. And he is involved in an MA program at the University of Innsbruck in peace development and conflict transformation. Beyond his academic career, he's an activist. He was research director for the World Information Institute, which is a non-profit organization aiming to create a critical public understanding of art, science, and technology. And until 2012, he was research associate on, the, on media activism. It's a project at the University of Innsbruck. And now I give the word to you for your input on you know, the context of today's media, technological developments, in this context where you're working and theorizing, what is the notion of sharing as an imperative? Thank you. Thank you very much, Elke. Thanks to the Goethe Institute for uh, uh, making this extraordinary event possible here. Um, very pleased to be here. Um, Rajiv, you were asking about um, What's the opposite concept of sharing? It's a difficult one. Uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, the French philosopher, has suggested a word. Um, the opposite of sharing is idiocy. Um, so um, coming from the, from the Greek word idiotes, um, referring to a person who only is capable of, somebody who's not capable of going beyond him or herself. Um, so the idiotis is considered a, 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 a stupid person because he or she is not capable of generating any meaning. The idiotis is basically doomed to a meaningless existence because he or she cannot reach beyond himself, is incapable of sharing. So that would be the opposite of sharing. Now, Jean-Luc Nossi says, um, Meaning derives from shared being. So the very act of sharing, the possibility of sharing is also the possibility of meaning. And that to me may be one of the, one of the attractions, one of the strong appeals that the concept of sharing holds nowadays. Because we are, as, as, as you have already uh, pointed out in the Indian context, I think living in a world in which more than a sharing imperative, we're experiencing an, ex an, an imperative of exchange. Um, an imperative to, ex to make everything exchangeable and to consider things within the exchangeability. Baudrillard has, has written about that um, and, and referred to exchange as the moral law of modernity. That which is not exchangeable cannot be exchanged is basically a, a non-existent and a violation of the existing order. So another appeal I think that sharing has nowadays is, is that it, it, it allows us to draw boundaries to limit the concept of exchange and therefore to limit or escape our fate to be people, to be idiotes, no? to be people who cannot generate meaning. Um, I think that is a very strong appeal that sharing has, and perhaps also one of the reasons why sharing has become this, um, this huge theme in the online media. Mm? Um, something that feels good, but under which 
we always find a, a, a lurking promise for a meaningful existence we share with others, then that becomes possible. We, we cease to be idiotes. Hmm? We, we can become, we can actually generate, generate meaning. To me, it's been important when I did my research on media activism um, to understand more accurately the conceptual dimension of sharing because people use the word as, you know, in, in very different ways. Uh, most frequently, and this has happened ever since I've been here, I've heard it, um, sharing is confused or considered something um, equivalent to exchange. Uh, in, in my own work, I've seen that sharing and exchange are in fact very different things. Um, sharing acts as a limit to exchange. It limits exchange. It, um, Sharing begins where exchange, whether of an economic nature or of a symbolic nature, ceases, where the accounts no longer matter, where there is no give and take, where there's no reciprocity and no accounting of equivalences. That makes sharing an extraordinarily difficult thing to research because we tend to conduct our research within the best Western catalog of methods as, um, as a system of equivalences itself, and therefore constantly keep exchanging exchange with sharing. Um, perhaps my title for the event would be um, Tauschen und Teilen, perhaps Tauschen oder Teilen, two different things. So um, in, in my own research, I looked at how um, how um, philosophers have, have thought about sharing phenomenologists like, um, like Heidegger, who consider um, existence, our existence in the world, our being in the world as a shared being, something that we cannot escape. The moment we're on the world, we already share. Our being is a shared being. And um, therefore, we are not subjects. We are not individual, uh, individually contained um, subjects that are that, that, you know, capable only of exchanging and, and engaging in and reciprocal actions. Through sharing, we therefore are capable of creating communities, commonality. The word commons is um, um, used, has been used for describing resources in agriculture, but also in knowledge. Um, that allow us, um, through their common use, to generate communities, to generate a kind of commonality, something that exchange does not do. Exchange creates very different types of social relations um, than, um, than sharing does. Um, so sharing is a limit of exchange as the end of a self-contained self, sharing as the possibility of generating meaning, of ceasing to be idiotes. Um, leads to the question, is sharing something universal? Is sharing, some, sharing something culturally specific? Now, in the forms that it takes, and we've just given us wonderful examples, sharing is um, definitely culturally specific, but it remains universal in as much as we share the world. As we are on the world, we share the world, just as we share the air or the light in this room without have actually actually doing anything, actually formalizing that kind of situation in any way. Um, so so it's, it's, it's kind of both. What's the European, within the European um, canon of, of philosophical ideas, where can we situate sharing? In Europe, we've had a theorizing of exchange, we have had the, the, the origin of classical economic theory with uh, Smith and Ricardo, but we've also had a strong theorizing of symbolic exchange in the work of people like um, Bourdieu and, and um, Baudrillard. Um, we've had um, socialist theorists who thought of sharing as the foundation of a new type of society, and we've had um, Bataille as one of the very few theorists who have had the courage and perhaps the mad spirit of adventure to actually start looking at what happens if you leave behind the world 
of exchange. That's the world of Bataille. That's his general theory of an economy. And to me, when we talk about the sharing economy, I insist that a sharing economy, if it is about sharing, can only be an economy in the sense of Bataille. That means in the sense of um, looking at the economy as something not governed by scarcity, um, not governed by the necessity of production, but on the opposite, um, something that is about expenditure and about what we do with what we have. Um, it came up in uh, Rifkin's talk yesterday when he talked about the first principle of, uh, what was it, thermodynamics, constant, constancy of, of, of energy. But I see this in a solar economy. Um, what about religion? Christianity has um, a few interesting things to say about, um, about um, sharing. One of them would be contained in the example of Martin of Tours, Saint Martin, as the Christians call him, who cuts his cloak into two halves and gives one of the halves to the beggar. That's different from giving the cloak to the beggar. And I think to me that's an important point in, 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 in the New Testament and in Christianity, that they make a difference between giving and sharing. So Martin doesn't give away his coat, he shares his coat, he cuts it into pieces, half of the coat gets to, um, uh, he gives um, to the beggar. He is then ridiculed by his comrades. Now Martin is a, is a, is a, is a soldier, he's in a very strong hierarchical kind of uh, system. He's ridiculed by um, his colleagues for becoming the equal of the beggar, and I think this is what happens when we share. Um, as we share, we become equals, we become members of an equal community within which the type of symbolic interaction, the type of symbolic exchange that allows us to form hierarchies ceases to be. That may be the interest that communism has had uh, in sharing. Um, in the New Testament itself, you have a few very powerful statements in favor of sharing and against the system of exchange. Most prominently, perhaps, the feeding of the multitude, where um, Jesus is asked by the disciples, shall we go and buy food for all of these people who are here? And he says, in return, don't do that. Don't engage in economic exchange, but share what we have. And then the result is not only gets everybody gets enough food, but there's actually food that's left over. Uh, so an idea that's taken up by, by Bataille. Um, the New Testament also argues against giving and in favor of forgiving. Um, that is, for example, in the, exam in, 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 in the case of turning the other cheek. Um, of course, Christian rituals include sharing rituals, such as, um, such as breaking the bread at Mass to remind Christian communities of the equal kind of status. Um, ideally, that is, the possibility. Um, um, another question here that comes up is, um, what about economic hardship and affluence, and um, how does sharing refer to these? Um, I think there are three things happening. Um, if we consider sharing as something where the accounts cease to matter, where the taking account, the giving and taking ceases, you will find sharing among the very poor and you will find it among the very rich. Um, you will not find it in the middle class. The middle class is, is the kind of um, place in society where exchange predominates and therefore everybody needs to have their own car, their own washing machine and so on. The American dream, no sharing. Um, no sharing there. So I think, um, just to conclude here, um, that um, all of these resources that I mentioned and many more can help us to develop a more precise understanding of what happens in sharing. Um, sharing as the possibility of equality, the possibility of community, the possibility of meaning, but not the necessity of it. Only the possibility, but I think that's already a lot.
given where we are today. Thank you. So as far as Thank you very much, Wolfgang. I think something that was fascinating when listening to your three different interventions was that this idea of imperative sharing as something that is positively connoted, you know, where we started off at the beginning, you know, from the three monotheistic religions, that this idea of this positive connotation really came up in all of your three interventions. I mean, Rajiv, you spoke about basically the absence of this sharing as rampant egoism, as something negative. You mentioned, uh, very similar to Wolfgang, that sharing is the basis of community. And Wolfgang, you started us off with saying sharing is the basis of meaningful existence. I would like to challenge this notion and put in this idea of Eva Iluz yesterday said, sharing is not political, politically superior to not sharing. And I would even go so far to say that, you know, there can be violent forms of sharing. You mentioned the slaves, you mentioned the women. You know, that sharing is, can be acts of establishing authority and power. And I would like to give this back to you in order to tackle this notion of sharing to be so very positive. Maybe would you like to start off? Sure. Uh, I did mention, as you said, that there is one form of sharing which is negative, which is self-abnegating, self-denying. Uh, there is an element of coercion involved in it, so it's compul compulsion present. So uh, I welcome, in some ways, the collapse of hierarchical societies and people who had hitherto you know, been denying themselves and always thinking that their desires are not, you know, they have no worth at all. They finally articulating their desires full and, and trying to fulfill them. Uh, but on, but where, where, so that's a positive thing, uh, but where it, it becomes, negative is when it begins to model itself on the available forms of assertion of self-interest, which are, as I said, and I, and I think pleonectic, pleonexia to me is still better than idiotic, uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it more vividly uh, presents as non-sharing. Uh, Idiocy is something which is, uh, you know, you have to take a few more steps before you come to non-sharing. Uh, whereas in Plinexia, it's all pretty well laid out. So I think uh, uh, I would say uh, there is something positive in non-sharing as well. Uh, as, for example, when uh, those who have suffered inequalities or uh, all kinds of violence, uh, uh, exclusions, when they begin, I mean, to, to, to say, we're not going to share things with you, I think that's positive. So there is a positive moment there uh, in non-sharing. But I think uh, to, to remain permanently entrapped in that moment of non-sharing would be, would, 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 would for me uh, not be correct. There is a certain dialectic in which sharing and non-sharing uh, uh, you know, must sublate themselves into a superior form of sharing where there is, uh, it's more voluntary and more equal. Equal sharing is what really we are after. Uh, and I would say, finally, that, uh, that there are two forms of sharing. One is, uh, this is uh, to do with the point that Wolfgang made about uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, Martin taking uh, a part of his cloth and giving it rather than the whole of it. And that's kind of, you know, that's distributive. You know, it's keeping something to yourself but also giving it. Uh, but there is another perspective in which somehow you manage to bring that, I mean, this bring that person within the whole cloth, as it were. You know, so the, so the, so the, that if you, if you don't have this restricted clothing, but if you have a chador, for example, or a 
blanket. You, you actually embrace that other person and bring that person in the fold of the, of the each other, of the blanket, and so that both are now wrapped within the same cloth, so sharing it in common, right? So here there's no division of the cloth, but so, so, so sharing is both uh, doing something in common, which is much stronger and robust, but sharing is also uh, dividing something uh, uh, and giving a bit of it away to others and keeping the rest to, to yourself. And, 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 and in non-sharing and pleonexia, you have neither, you see. You neither, uh, you don't want to, if you have something, you don't want to give it away, and you certainly don't want anything to share in common with others. So neither of that is there. So, yeah. So we are starting to differentiate, you know, sharing as having negative and po positive sides. Would any of you like to react to Rajiv? Uh, uh, in the Philippines, uh, sharing becomes inefficient when the community refuses to share uh, goods or other resources. So uh, the practice becomes inefficient. Um, in some cases. At the same time, there is like uh, oversharing where you have to give everything when there is, where sharing becomes excess. Uh, too much to give away. You know? At the same time, it becomes inalienable where, like what Rajiv said, you keep something for yourself and you give a part of that share to some people. So there's sharing as a form of excess and sharing as a form of uh, inefficiency in some cases. We, we don't have to share microphones, right. it seems. <laughs> I think the element of, of um, division, of dividing and sharing, is not necessarily a negative one. Um, because what it reminds us of is we have, um, as we share, we really cease to be the kind of Western isolated subjects mm, that, that can define themselves within, within, within their own terms, and we become porous, we become, uh, we really cease to be ourselves as individuals, as we share. So the moment of sharing already means a division within myself that I cannot, that I cannot overcome, that I have to live with, and that, that exists as I share. And, and one of the problems that we have with systems of exchange is they keep reiterating the isolated, singular individual as, you know, in the classic form of the Western, of the Western subject. And I think part of the appeal of the discourse on sharing now is that it helps us, it may help us if we conduct it <laughs> rightly, in, in, to, 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 to get new perspectives on... Um, on individuality, on singularity and plurality, and perhaps uh, use those kinds of insights um, um, to understand political community, which is, which is what uh, Jean-Luc Jean Nossi tries to do in being singular plural. Um, a, a very hard piece to read, but I think nevertheless a very, a very important point, that as we share, singularity and plurality uh, really uh, begin to be the same thing. And, and I am singular only in as much as I am plural. And that opens me up to others as a, as a, as a political being. Uh, and, and I think what we're seeing now with the, with, with the advance of neoliberalism um, into all spheres of society and all corners of the world is the opposite of that. So if you want to have an anti-neoliberal kind of political discourse, I, I think sharing offers some kinds of possibilities of, of, of moving, moving that ahead. I would like to prompt you to go a bit further. As a media theorist, how does all of this play out in the social media? Annalyn, you just mentioned the word access. I think, you know, who has access and who profits, I think are two of the key questions today when we talk about internet and sharing economy and social media. So. Please, can you take our imperative sharing into this context and tell us more about how you see the workings of imperative sharing in the context of social media? I, mean, I only have negative things to say about it because... That's okay. 
Because I think what we're seeing in the social media is it uses the appeal, the niceness of sharing to cover a business model that's really quite insidious. Um, what happens now on the social media is that we have a business model that bases in itself on people's desire to form communities, to have communal relationships, to share, to open themselves up to others. And that very possibility, that very desire is capitalized upon um, by the corporate social media. So, so when, when um, Byung Chul Han, the, the German Korean philosopher, says that what neoliberalism does is it turns freedom itself into a resource for capital, I think that's exactly what is happening there. Now, this is, this is what happens on the corporate social media. We have the exercise of freedom, the quest for meaning, the desire to form communities as itself a business model, as a form of capitalization, and, 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 and it's, it's a contradictory kind of situation of which, of, about which I'm, I'm rather pessimistic. Um, and and um, I have no solution for it right now, unfortunately. Uh, Go ahead. Social media is uh, it's like an enabling tool to share uh, and to connect, especially in the cases of uh, uh, people in diaspora. So they use this as an enabling tool to connect, to share, um, express their identity, whether it's collective or individual at the same time. And also a platform. On the other hand, there's a negative um, effect of this social media, but also as a platform. No? to express and to advocate for something, uh, especially in the communities where uh, this kind of um, blurring identity uh, uh, caused by modernity. You know? So it's a, it's a platform, it's also an enabling tool to connect and share uh, ideas, meanings, and stories. And ideologies. May I, may I Go ahead. Um, sure. I think all of this is true, but I think what we have to remember in the case of in the case of social media, all of these possibilities that that you have mentioned, and the reason why you know millions and millions of people use social media, is we can do those things, but at the price of abandoning our our quality of citizens in favor of becoming human capital. Um, I, fi I find uh, Wendy Brown's book uh, very useful in that regard, where she, she describes that transition that happens in neoliberalism from you know, the ideal of the citizen to the ideal of human capital. Every bit of, genera and it, every bit of information that I share on social media is immediately turned into capital. As a social media user, I use the social media in the form of human capital, and and that is a th something that, that you know that some people have tried to 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 start find solutions for, but I think very often what we the sharing on the social media uh, generates the illusion of community, the 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 um, um, a, a kind of a kind of. Uh, uh, vague idea of what communities could be. And I find that particularly sad because on the other hand, what we see on the social media is how strong the desire is to form communities, to form networks that take us beyond our immediate concerns. And it's particularly sad that that desire should be capitalized and turned into something that is once again exchangeable and a commodity on the market. But maybe, again, looking at the other side and taking up your idea of uh, social media and new forms of sharing, uh, of being all, enabling tools, because the question I had to you from the beginning was how kind of these new forms of sharing and communicating, how do these new forms impact the forms of sharing and imperative sharing that you describe to us here? How do they interact? Uh, our social media have also affected uh, communities, uh, such as the form of exchange. 
uh, there's a transition or a transformation from traditional forms of sharing, like what I've shown you earlier, like um, meat, rice, whatever in the community. Now there's an entry of cash economy uh, coming in. So there's a, they have to adjust or they have to change the forms of exchange and sharing in the community. You know? uh, like um, cash came in, so uh, it becomes more complex. The form of exchange have become complex. Um, people from the communities are moving to the cities you know, to, to get the opportunity to interact with the modernity, etc. So it also changed the values of the people, uh, the priorities and the, the opportunities that they would like to, to take. So in a way, sharing is different now, nowadays. I'd just like to add to Of course, no, go ahead, well, go I ahead. Just, I mean, I actually think that what I mean, there is an element of truth, as he, Wolfgang, agrees in, in what uh, you're saying. I mean, that there is, a, there is a, 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 an opportunity and a, a something enabling about new media, social media. On the other hand, there is an overwhelming uh, compulsion in, built into the business model. Uh, which uh, ignites and which nourishes social media to overwhelm it, and and uh, so so there is a kind of a tension there, and uh, uh, how we will use it and and with what kind of agency we approach these will determine, you know, whether uh, citizens are able to make use of it. Uh, for uh, better ends, or or whether uh, everything will be subsumed and reduced to 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 capital. I mean, it, it's so. So I I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of immediately reduce one to the other, and say that it's all going to be you know it's already always already you know turning into human capital. Uh, but I would say that there is a very strong tendency for that to happen, uh, and and. Uh, and we've, we've got to find ways and imagine, you know, new ways of, of, uh, of not succumbing to it and being able to, you know, uh, utilize some of it for, for alternative purposes. So there is a kind of, once again, uh, a major conflict there. Uh, and it's, it's useful to, to address that both these elements are present and, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Would you like to? Add something, Wolfgang? I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. a little bit less optimistic, in a sense. I, and I know many colleagues and activists who, who, who use the corporate social media for their own purposes because, you know, you, you don't have to recognize every moment of the day that at the moment you enter a Facebook page, you're a human capital, you're a resource for a corporation. That's what happens. But I think there is this moment. You, obviously, these platforms, they, 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 they want you to share, and they use the rhetoric of sharing as being pro-social, as being open to others, and so on, um, in, 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 in an inauthentic way, in a, in a dishonest way. Um, because the moment you share, you generate a stream of data that in that very moment is already capital. And in as much as your, as your subjectivity on a social medium is a digital subjectivity, you only exist in the form of a data set, you can't escape that situation of being human capital. Now, I recognize that there may be many situations where people, even activists, who are anti-neoliberal activists or pro-community activists, use social media to beneficial purposes. It doesn't mean that in the background this is not happening. And, and I think at this time we're, we're, we're in, in a, not in a situation to gauge what the long-term consequences of that are going to be in terms of how we can organize ourselves politically and, and, and as communities. And what I keep telling my students is that one day Facebook will be gone. It's just not gonna be there anymore. 
And many of them tell me, well, we're not on Facebook. For us, it's already over. We're doing other things. So it's hard to say. Um, are there limits to sharing? I mean, are there limits I, to yeah, sharing? Are there limits to sharing? Um, I think there are limits to sharing in as much as there are limits to meaningful communal relationships. Um, sharing has often been, um, in the past, associated with intimacy. So really, the moment you, you, you overcome any kind of engagement and exchange, you enter the sphere of intimacy, where no longer any accounts are taken, where no longer any differentiation happens um, between one and the other. And <clears throat> there are limits to that. There are limits to how many people you can allow into that kind of relationship without getting too anxious. It's, a, it's an idea that Shosh Bataille plays with a lot you know, in his ideas about orgies and, 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 and so on. Um, right. But um, just, just to conclude this, um, the problem of oversharing comes from that that we keep forgetting that sharing actually has an intimate quality to it, which makes it so powerful. But that's also its limit. I think there is a minor but an important disagreement between Wolfgang and me on this. Uh, I'm, I have greater ambivalence towards it. And I have uh, also, I, I feel that the intentionality that is embedded in the, the whole technology uh, and in social media, the active business intentionality, uh, which is to control. Uh, uh, there is always something elusive, as there is in language. I mean, there's something elusive about it which escapes control. And so even though there is an, there is an, there is an desire, I mean, it doesn't have to be felt in the, in the consciousness of the person, who is, uh, it's, as I said, it's embedded, but even though that control mentality is, is kind of embedded in the technology and in the whole uh, framework of the social media, there is also something which disenables it, and so the people are unable to, people who want to control are unable to fully control it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where, that's where the hope lies, so it's, you know, it's uh, 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 so. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's that's. Well, I, I, I share that hope with yes, you. Yes, I share okay. that hope okay. with you okay. definitely. <laughs> well, um, you you said that you were not optimistic, and and I'm not optimistic either. But I have, I I still have that mild kind of, uh, you know, something in me which is kind of doesn't doesn't want to admit to this massive pessimism where everything is going to simply be <laughs> that's that's a it's a it's a diff slight difference yeah, I, I will not respond to it yeah. <laughs> I think there. maybe we leave it at that with a slight optimistic yeah. touch and because I would like to give the chance to the audience I want to talk a little about mm. it you know not myself but I wanted some response mm. maybe if the audience would give it on on these shared <laughs> sacred spaces and the you know, if there is a genuine difference in traditions about that, I mean, uh, the older tradition where, you know, by, by translation or by hyphenation uh, or, and by all the subtle encouragement, you know, you, you worship many gods because you don't believe that there is any god which is no, no. Uh, and, and, and so I, 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 that would be an interesting, you know, this kind of spiritual sharing, sharing of sites where you can see a temple as a mosque and a mosque as a temple, or, or you know, uh, where Hindus and Muslims can go and worship at the same shrine of a saint who some people believe is Hindu and some are Muslims. Uh, nobody, you know, when you build an ancestry, you say, well, we don't know whether he's Hindu or Muslim. Th those traditions survive, but they are, they, are, they are disappearing, but they survive in many parts of the world. And, and, and uh, a certain kind of modernity, but also a certain resource. It's a resource in certain traditions, which, which kind of is against it. And uh, against that kind of sharing, there is an exclusion built into it. And I, I think it's a genuine difference. And 
uh, we should talk more about it. I mean, so, so, okay, I so let's take up the, the exactly this question of the exclusivity or inclusivity of uh, religion, shared sacred traditions. Mm -hmm. Let's take this up as the last uh, thing to be debated. Mm -hmm. I would like to also collect two, three questions from the audience and then invite you to make one final round where we also take up this point. Yeah. Okay. So I see... Hello. Uh, um, it's hard for me to see. Yeah, sorry. One uh, hand here. It's okay. Yeah. I go and I, I hand to you. Okay. Um, thank okay. you all There's for really uh, fantastic discussion. And I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask one, which is relating to this uh, notion of that social media turned us all into human capital. And I just wonder if if you could speak to you a little bit that maybe that that we were all ready, like I don't know as if we, social media turned us into human capital, that 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 might have been operative, it like predates human capital, if you could speak to that in the way that, in in sharing that, <clears throat> as, as you guys have sensed, there's a lot of positive aspects to it, but you know, it seems like even in, in the ancient communities, there's a kind of, not monetizing people, but this idea of ownership through marking or uh, tracking people in a way. I guess the question is, uh, w were we kind of in, in, in a non-digital way uh, just being involved in the social world, human capital, I guess is the question. Like, rather than just like logging onto Facebook, just by buying stuff, weren't we already kind of doing that? And that maybe social media is actually just a really kind of crass technological way of tracking that. That's okay. the question. Thank you. And the gentleman up there? Should I ask my, my question right now or? Uh, yes, please, we're collecting the questions okay. and then we'll have one final round. Uh, so, so LK, as a moderator, uh, said that Wolfgang specialized for the theories of sharing. I'm myself a PhD uh, uh, student, and I uh, was wondering, I have not encountered any th theory, dedicated theory of sharing. So there is certain work involved uh, in, on the social a domain, uh, anthropological, communication science, religious, etc. If uh, there's any dedicated theory of sharing, I was wondering, could one name that one? Or maybe something that complement the notion, uh, that would describe the notion uh, of sharing. Um, uh, obviously, there's social exchange theories or social practices, however, why there is no de dedicated uh, um, theory of sharing? And then I had one hand up here, the gentleman. Two observations which would go to Mr. Bhargava in the Indian context. Um, I think sharing always has to be addressed to specific needs, otherwise it's a, a uniform fabric that's being shared between people with equal needs, but we have specific needs. And um, in the Indian context, I think it used to be so that if you would say to someone in India, I really like your jacket, that person would feel obliged to give you his jacket. Because the feeling was that by you expressing your need in such a um, convincing way, you are actually showing that you need this jacket more than the gentleman who's actually wearing it at the moment. Um, this is a motive that I think is, as many other things that you mentioned have become or are becoming lost in India, but it used to be a motive. And maybe you can say something to that, because it's a very nice idea. You know, if I like your shoes uh, um, so much that I'm willing to ask for them, you are obliged to give them to me. Um, just your comment maybe on, on, on this observation. The other, you asked about the common spiritual space. And I would like to throw out the, um, the method maybe of the pilgrimage as something you might want to say something about, because this is where people um, coming from very different, maybe spiritual needs, are walking together 
to a common place. And maybe an Indian example, Sabrimala in South India, biggest pilgrimage um, in India. And also this, um, it's, a, it's a Vaishnavite, Shaivite common experience. Basically two different traditions that have been at loggerheads fighting for the allegiance in South India um, of, 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 of the spiritual adherence. And uh, in, the, in this pilgrimage, Shaivites and Vaishnavites can, can go and, uh, and experience their spiritual commonality. So maybe the, the idea of pilgrimage, maybe with the Sabramala um, um, example. So we have the f uh, four points, shared religious spaces, pilgrimage, the specific question on asking in India, the question on the theory of sharing, is there a theory of sharing, and the question of uh, social media. Who would like to go first? Would you like to start, Rajiv? Uh, mm. Yeah, so I'll respond to uh, what, what you said. I think I make a distinction between need and uh, preference, you know, or liking something. Uh, uh, there is an obligation, uh, and whether it is expressed or not, if I have a need and, and then if you have a need, uh, I should recognize it and give something to you. There's a very famous story in the Jatakas about the Bodhisattva. And uh, there are lots of very needy uh, people who come to him and he keeps giving it, you know, whatever he has away to them. And finally, uh, there's a very hungry, starving animal that appears and he has nothing to give him. So he gives up, he gives himself because he has nothing else to give them. Offers himself, uh, offers himself uh, uh, as as food to to the. So need is one thing, but like I'm not sure. You know, if somebody says I like your jacket, and I don't think I'm under any obligation to give that person uh, my jacket simply because that person likes it. I mean, he may have ten thousand jackets of his own, and he may still want mine. And I see no reason why he should be given that jacket. So I, I, would, I would certainly make a distinction between need and, 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 and liking something. On, on spiritual traditions, I absolutely agree. Uh, the Sabri Mala uh, is one, but where Hindu, uh, where Vaishnavites and Shaivites find a common spiritual space. But I was actually talking about something even more radical than that, where it's not just Hindus and, you know, Shavna, Shaivites and Vaishnavites who are part of some larger let's call it Hindu space, uh, uh, they share, but are Hindus and Muslims. And uh, you know, it'll be wonderful if there are such spaces between Christians and Muslims, or Muslims and Jews. I mean, after all, there is that space in, in Jerusalem where there is the, the, the Alak, what, what that mosque and, the, and that veiling wall, both on the same sites. And there is an example right there of the Holy Sepulchre Church where, you know, different uh, denominations of churches are, have, they fight, but they also share. I mean, I, well, I know, I know. I mean, that's the, the, those are two possibilities always. But I mean, as indeed the, 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 the Jewish Islam uh, Muslim thing, I mean, I mean the one, the, there are people who prepare to blow it and, and so on. But, but they could find a common space there, right? I mean, they, they, could, they could share it. It's not such a big deal. But, they, but there is a lot of exclusion. I mean, the, where are the spaces where Christians and Muslims can share something? And those spaces which existed in India are disappearing. However, there, is some, there are still some there. For example, the Ajmer uh, Chishti shrine. Hindus and Muslims go there. Not just Hindus and Muslims, ultra-nationalist Hindus, people who are in power today. Some of their leaders still go to the Ajmer Sufi shrine. So Hindus and Muslims travel to the same site and find some common spiritual space, even the, 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 least, the most exclusivist. But those spaces are disappearing. And I would very much want them somehow to reconfigure themselves and to represent themselves in new forms. Uh, and, 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 and so that we overcome this horrible uh, divide 
a, a spiritual pleonexia. <laughs> this, uh, this, uh, this has to be overcome. Uh, just to conclude, just to conclude, uh, for sharing, uh, this is dependent on the kind of relations as well as the motivations and obligations of uh, persons to other persons uh, outside of the community or globally or in diaspora. And in order to understand the complexities of sharing, we have to look into uh, the other array of um, that particular uh, community, for instance. Uh, why do they share? Is this based on social needs, political ideologies, uh, religious practices, among others? So both the context and the content should be factored in in order to understand what, what the sharing is all about. I don't know why I keep taking your microphone. But thanks for sharing it with me. <laughs> um, I was just reminded, thinking about Facebook, about a notice that appeared in a, in a, in a uh, restaurant in San Francisco where Facebook was shooting a promotional video. On the notice, it said all of the images that Facebook gathers in that restaurant this morning are the sole ownership, the sole property of Facebook in perpetuity and throughout the universe. That was meant as a serial, serious legal statement. Yeah. It, um, you know, not fun, but serious. Throughout the universe, anywhere, and in all perpetuity. So Facebook is God. <coughs> Talking about religion considers itself God. And I'm sure if Mark Zuckerberg was standing here listening to us, he would have no clue what we're even talking about. Critical thinking. Absent. Just had to say that. Um, to return to the question of labor and capital, are we automatically turning into human capital? Yes and no. Um, the two ways in which um, a corporate social media have been criticized, um, one is that on the social media we, are, we turn into unpaid laborers. We talk about people like Trevor Schultz, Tiziana Terranova from Italy, who have um, theorized that kind of, that kind of Criticism, we're performing free labor, we're basically digital, whatever, slaves, and, you know, employees that don't get paid. And the other one is, is, is human, is human um, capital. I think they, they all come out of, a, um, of the problem that we have with subjectivity in the digital media uh, per se. There was a 1993 cartoon that appeared in the New Yorker where you see a dog in front of a computer terminal typing away and the dog says to the other dog, on the internet nobody knows that you're a dog because you, you have a kind of fluid, undefined subjectivity which is, which is you know, a huge potentially, a huge, a huge uh, uh, possibility that the digital media offer. Hmm? And, and as we, if we look at the history of how, how the new media have evolved, we've, we've moved away from the dog uh, who doesn't tell anybody he's a dog to um, the Facebook user who is already completely determined and the very fluidity of subjectivity has become itself um, um, a, a, a business model. I think so there's very, very little possibility to, to escape that kind of human capital mode of existence unless you move away from those kind of social media or at least start taking them for what they are. Um, uh, and that will be my response to that. About theories of sharing, um, there are no sh theories of sharing in an explicit kind of fashion. The reason for that being that sharing has only been researched very recently. Very little work has, done about, has been done about it. Um, least of all by economists, um, because of the insistence that every kind of human relationship has to be described in terms of exchange. So what do you do when you move into a theme, into a subject, where that, that kind of requirement, that kind of basic assumption is absent? How do you research that? So um, 
So what I have done is I've looked a lot at criticism of, of exchange and ways that, that people have criticized and defined the limits of exchange, questioned the universality, the universal applicability of exchange and taken that as a point of departure from where you can think about sharing. I think in terms of actual theories, we have fragments, we have bits and pieces that are floating around right now. We have the work of Russell Belk that I need to highlight. Russell Belk, a consumer researcher from Canada, who's done very good work on sharing. But um, there is also a new book by Nicholas Chan, who's one of the speakers here, uh, and, and former PhD student of Eva Ilu, who spoke yesterday, um, about sharing. His book is out just now. There's a, a, a book by Friedrike Habermann, the, the German um, um, political theorist, um, out just a few days ago. Um, so people are making an effort whether that amounts to a theory of sharing, I doubt, but we're working on it. And before I thank you all and close this panel, please allow me to step out of the role of moderator and add one thought um, myself to the issue that you brought up and which really also made me think the reconfiguration of shared religious religious spaces in times when they are so contested because um, I see in Germany now this example in schools we used to have very segmented religious education you know the Protestant went to their little class and the Catholics to theirs so everybody had their own little segmented religious education. And that there are experiments now, there's one in Hamburg and in other places, where children actually go to one shared religious education, no matter from which religion they come from, which I see as a very positive step exactly in this direction of what you're saying to reconfigure this notion of shared religious space. And with that note, I do really want to thank you all for coming, for being here today, for sharing your thoughts and discussion here with us. Thank you to the panelists and thank you also to the organizers, the technique. Thank you, enjoy the symposium. <laughs> <laughs>